Certainty of law is an important factor in long-term economic development. Excessive legislation and regulation brings uncertainty to the businesses and investors. One day your business is fine, the next day it may be forbidden, overregulated, taxed, and so on. Stable law lowers uncertainty, allows to make long-term plans, thus encouraging investments. Increased investments leads to more effective production, cheaper products due to increased supply, and more jobs, which positively influences wages. Stable, certain law favors higher living standard. Unfortunately, we're living in the world of legislative inflation and excessive regulation. But does it have to be this way? What if we confuse the law with legislation? And it's a big mistake. What if our ancestors understood the law in a completely different way, and we've forgotten it all? Italian law professor and author of the book Freedom and the Law, Bruno Leone, will help us to answer these questions. First, he analyzes legal systems in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. He informs us that the Greek conception of the certainty of the law was that of a written law. It means that the law was considered to be certain because they were precisely worded in a written formula, which differentiated it from the arbitrary orders of tyrants. We know this kind of certainty of the law because we understand it the same today. Our laws are certain in the sense that it's written in bills and any man can read a bill and know what it says. However, as Leone informs, the Greeks faced a problem also similar to ours, legislative inflation. Lawmaking process, especially in Athenian democracy, where every fully fledged citizen could submit a bill proposal, led to the situation in which the law was certain in the meaning that it was written down, but any citizen couldn't be sure that a law that is in effect today would be in effect tomorrow, and if what's legal today would still be legal tomorrow. Athenians noticed the problem, and at the end of the 5th century BCE, Athenian politician Tesimenos reformed the system. After the reform, any bill proposal was studied by the committee of magistrates named Nomothetai whose job was to defend the previous legislation against the new proposal. Moreover, the proponent of the new bill was personally responsible for potential negative effects of the new law if it was voted in by the assembly. If someone was to prove that his proposal had grave defects or was in contradiction with the previous laws, he could be tried and even sentenced to death, although the most common punishment was a fine. We can sure learn something from history. Greeks, who understood political freedom in a somewhat similar way to classical liberals, came to the conclusion that this freedom won't be achieved solely by precisely written law, which can suddenly change at any given time. They realized that they need long-term stability of the law. After all, what is the practical difference between the fickleness of a tyrant and the fickleness of the demos, which every day replaces one certain law with the other equally certain? Because as you've probably already noticed, Greek certainty of the law is short-term certainty. Certainty of the law was understood differently in ancient Rome. As Leone writes, We probably are so used to thinking of the Roman legal system in terms of Justinian's corpus juris, that is, in terms of a written law book, that we fail to realize how Roman law actually worked. A large part of the Roman rules of law was not due to any legislative process whatsoever. Private Roman law, which the Romans called jus civil, was kept practically beyond the reach of legislators during most of the long history of the Roman Republic and the Empire. Eminent scholars, such as the late Italian professors Rotondi and Vincenzo Arangio Ruiz, and the late English jurist William Warwick Buckland, repeatedly point out that the fundamental notions, the general scheme of the Roman law, must be looked for in the civil law a set of principles gradually evolved and refined by a jurisprudence extending over many centuries, with little interference by a legislative body. Of course, legislation existed in Rome, but it mainly applied to government officials. Professor Leone quotes Buckland's words, who says that from the many hundred of legis, or bills, which remain to this day, 
only 40 were of importance in the private law. Roman citizens rarely based their claims on a written rule precisely worded, and therefore certain in the Greek or short run sense of the word in case of disagreement about their rights or duties. But because of the Roman lawmaking process, or should we say, law discovery process, they could plan their actions much further ahead than the Greeks. Thus, in the Roman concept, the certainty of the law meant long-term stability. Leone informs us that the Roman jurist was a sort of scientist. The objects of his research were the solutions to cases that citizens submitted to him for study, just as industrialists might today submit to a physicist or to an engineer a technical problem concerning their plants or their production. Hence, private Roman law was something to be described or to be discovered not something to be enacted, a world of things that were there, forming part of the common heritage of all Roman citizens. Nobody enacted the law. Nobody could change it by any exercise of his personal will. This did not mean absence of change, but it certainly meant that nobody went to bed at night making his plans on the basis of a present rule, only to get up the next morning and find that the rule had been overturned by a legislative innovation. As we've mentioned, legislation existed in Rome, but there is another important thing to notice here. The law wasn't identified with legislation. Professor Leone, invoking Cicero, tells us that every bill proposal had to include a clause that said, if there is in this bill whose approval I am requesting of you, anything that is not legal, your approval of it is to be considered as not requested. It means that the bill wasn't the law and even could be contrary to the law. Leone describes this idea of legitimacy as strikingly similar to English rule of law, and then adds, according to the English principle of the rule of law, which is closely connected with the whole history of the common law, rules were not properly the result of the exercise of the arbitrary will of particular men. They are the objects of a dispassionate investigation on the part of courts of judicature just as the Roman rules were the object of a dispassionate investigation on the part of the Roman jurists to whom litigants submitted their cases. We have to emphasize, however, that in modern England, law is more and more confused with legislation. What Leone describes like this, a revolution is occurring in England by virtue of the gradual overturning of the law of the land, by way of statutory law, and through the conversion of the rule of law into something that is now increasingly coming to resemble the continental etat de droit. That is, a series of rules that are certain only because they are written, and in general, not because of a common belief on the part of the citizens about them, but because they have been decreed by a handful of legislators. There were English lawyers who stood up to this revolution. For example, Sir Matthew Hale, who emphasized the role of being well informed by studies and reading what were the judgments and resolutions and decisions and interpretations of former ages, as a way to keep as near as may be to the certain of the law and the consonance of it to itself, and he meant long-term certainty of the law. Similarly to Hayek in economics, Sir Matthew Hale warned about the fatal conceit in the area of the law by saying, it is a reason for me to prefer a law by which a kingdom hath been happily governed four or five hundred years than to adventure the happiness and peace of a kingdom upon some new theory of my own. To sum up, certainty of the law was understood in two different ways. Short-term certainty as a precisely worded laws in a written formula, and long-term certainty as a long-term stability, which allowed to plan ahead without worrying about sudden law changes. What we need today is the second one, long-term stability. As we can see, there were greatly respected legal systems, like Roman and English, that could maintain long-term stability of the law for a long period of time. So the question has to be beginning, but does it have to be this way? We say no, because there is sensible and proven alternatives. 